qui sont marqués comme ça. Alors, notre zone de travail qu'on en avait déjà discuté, c'est globalement tout le long de la côte, vers le nord, sur les... Jean-Michel Bichin est un biologist. Il est aussi un teacher dans une horticultural school in Alsace. Et quand organisant cette expédition, il espérait d'intégrer cinq de ses étudiants. Le team a aussi un autre teacher, un zoobiologist, as well as photographer. But before leaving Long Yearbyen, they must yet complete their equipment. Spitsbergen is the main island of the Svalbard archipelago, and this territory is autonomous, even though linked administratively to Norway. Populated by only 2,000 inhabitants, Long Yearbyen is the most northern capital of the planet. Former mining town, it is now the starting point of numerous expeditions to the pole, be they scientific or touristic. Jean-Michel and Camille came searching for an indispensable accessory. These rifles are obligatory in Svalbard because of polar bears. Last season, a tourist was killed in an attack. The boat will take them tomorrow. They are quite ready for the big departure. The team joins the study area by sea. The mission has two objectives. The first is scientific. Conduct a biodiversity inventory and search for the biological indications of global warming. The second objective is educational. Jean-Michel hopes to convey the skills and the taste for field inventory work to his young teammates. We have a last-minute program change on the advice of the ship's second-in-command. Basically, he recommends a more wind-sheltered zone, better suited for our camp. Jean-Michel, Camille and Marie Lilith board the Zodiac. They hope to find a landing site suitable for the establishment of the base camp. We'll look at two sites, in fact. We'll look at the site aimed for at first, Phantom Moden, which is the Phantom Cape. We'll see what the terrain is like, and then go a little more north to a second possible platform, and then we'll choose well, now. Once the docking site chosen, it will no longer be possible to carry the gear over long distances. So the most appropriate site must be chosen right away for spending the next three weeks. Although there's a little distance, there's plenty of wood. Even if there's 200 meters to walk, it's okay. While Jean-Michel looks for the rest of the team, Marie Lilith immediately loads the rifle. After three round trips, everyone is on the beach. the beach. Thank you very much. Have a good trip. Thank you very much and have a good vacation. Okay, see you in two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Well, here we go. <laughs> At first glance, there's wood. Well, maybe we'll be able to warm up and prepare a fire. It seems that keeps away bears, but it will also allow us to heat water and eat. But otherwise, there's not much, actually. Sinon, il n'y a pas grand-chose, effectivement. <laughs> we'll give it a go. On va essayer. Now, the 750 kilos of equipment of the expedition must be moved. The strength of this mission is to bring on site, on the terrain, all the material necessary for a scientific study. Researchers generally find it difficult to work in these extreme places, especially with such logistics. Due to this, Svalbard is very poorly known with regards to biodiversity. Only 20% of the territory has been studied. Located in the Arctic Ocean, the Svalbard archipelago has a polar climate. The landscape bears the scars of this extreme climate. One sees primarily rock and ice. 60% of the territory is covered by glaciers. Life has only very little room to grow, and above all, it must confront here the terrible polar winter. At the 
this latitude, the sun disappears completely for five months of the year. The polar night lasts from October to February, with temperatures reaching minus 40 degrees Celsius. Svalbard is then amassed in the Arctic ice flow. Even when the sun reappears, the rays have little impact and bring barely any heat. The thermometer passes above zero only during the months of June, July and August. With such a short favorable period and the ground frozen up to 100 meters deep, life prospers with difficulty here. The whole team sets off towards the first research station. Preparation for the expedition has taken all of their spare time for months. They will finally be able to start working. And for now, the weather is surprisingly favorable to field work. After a few hours hike, they reach the top of the glacier. While there are no plants or even earth to speak of, will they find life here? We raise the pebbles at the edge of the snowbank. The temperature is just over zero degrees, and yet I see a small columbola. So we've small fauna developing here. Off we go to raise stones, and we see columbolas. The technique is to turn over stones, often those close to the water. Watch, see if something moves. And once we see something, try to catch it with a wet brush and gently transfer it to this tube with alcohol. Columbola are one of the rare organisms that survive in such conditions. They live at the foot of glaciers, in the mud and stones. To move in such an opaque environment, they have a long pair of antennae. Their body is covered with hooked hairs that allow them to trap air and have an oxygen reserve when immersed in the mud. Snow is also not an obstacle for them. Columbola, in fact, secrete an antifreeze protein that inhibits the formation of crystals of ice up to minus six degrees Celsius. Columbola survives the long winter by reducing its metabolism to the strict minimum. All vital functions are then reduced but they can resume a normal life as soon as the temperatures become positive. These columbola have adapted to the extreme climate of Spitsbergen, but what can they possibly feed on? We have here what is probably a very short ecosystem, consisting of very few links. Organic matter has therefore either been imported by the wind, for example, debris, or by movement of the glacier, etc or eventually bacteria that produce organic matter from mineral water. And then these little creatures seize the opportunity and eat, and will eventually be eaten themselves by one or two species. We've seen spiders a bit lower down. To escape predators, columbola have a secret weapon, a jumping organ placed under their abdomen. When it unravels, it allows them to leap more than 10 centimeters, which on our scale would correspond to a jump over the Eiffel Tower. An extreme environment, it is above all a medium that's biologically poor, but poor in terms of number of species, because it's rich in that the species that are here are extremely well adapted and whose evolutionary history is unique and linked to these ecosystems. If organisms are found at the edge of the glacier, can one find life in the glacier too? Yes, even ice is an ecosystem. These microscopic algae undergo photosynthesis. Thanks to the sun, they produce organic matter. This organic matter is the favorite meal of rotifers strange animals that owe their names to the two crowns of cilia which surround the head and function like a wheel. They swirl in opposite directions to move nutrient particles towards their mouths. A 
and here is the largest predator in this food chain, which measures not more than one millimeter, the tardigrade, which is also called bear cub of the water due to the funny way it moves. It doesn't swim, but uses its impressive claws to cling to fragments of plants, which gives this clumsy looking motion. If tardigrades are found everywhere on the planet, it's certainly due to their amazing capacity to resist in extreme conditions. They survive toxic products, radiation, vacuum voids, and high pressures in an incredible way. In order to not freeze, they are able to empty 99% of their water and replace it in their cells by a sugar that they synthesize or take from algae they eat. Back to the camp, Jean-Michel shows us around. And let's start simply with where we sleep, which can be considered our dormitory. A small detour by our weather station. And a weather station here is actually not anecdotal. I remind you, we take samples of flora and fauna, and it is always interesting to correlate weather information to our samples. And that's our base tent that's split into multiple spaces. First is the common space where we hold meetings, eat if necessary. We'll start with the pharmacy, the medical center. I cross our common space again to arrive in front of a place that I like particularly, our field laboratory. Here Marie Lilith works on our database. So this is the framework of our expedition, our place of life and our place of work. And then I tend to say a place of beautiful discoveries, scientific discoveries, and then for most of us, enriching experiences, discovery of the field, discovery of biodiversity, of Arctic environments, and for some of us, especially among my students, I hope, discovery of vocations on the environment and on biodiversity. If glaciers can harbor microorganisms, they are too cold and too unstable for life to develop in a more visible manner. The majority of the species on Spitsbergen should therefore be found in the narrow but relatively stable band found between the glacier and the sea, the tundra. It is to this area that the team will now turn. But to access this study area, you have to cross this river of melted snow. The water is only a few degrees above zero and the rocks are slippery. Some will not emerge safely from this crossing. Roland, the second teacher, has sprained his ankle. I slid on a stone and I fell in the water and my ankle has slightly suffered. OK, we'll bandage it. These small incidents do not prevent them from continuing their work and they can start the inventory of the flora. So I note the GPS coordinates of the station we're going to study. So we have latitude, longitude, altitude, and a short general description of the environment. And then we place our quadra and count the species there eight times. We note soil quality, which means do we have gravel, sediments, etc to get a general idea of the species present here. We started from the sea and will go towards the mountain, in fact, and we'll repeat this several times along the coast around our camp. The goal is to better understand the ecology of these species, what milieu they prefer, where to find them in greater numbers, an amount of data that will be added to those already existing on other areas of the archipelago. In addition to combating the cold and the polar night, plants here have to fight a third enemy, the terrain. If you look a little bit around us, we see that there are areas completely covered by vegetation, and then areas that are less or not at all, 
and this is linked to the stability of the soil 